My name is Gail Graves. I'm 57 years old. I've been a crossing guard at that same corner for 25 years now. And I know generations of kids, from families to now their grandkids. I went to the doctor, and she's like, well, we're going to do an ultrasound and look at you. Then they did the biopsy. Then she called me back and said, I think you better pay attention. She's telling me about cancer treatment and that she had people for me to talk to. Gail came to me with an unusual presentation. She came to me with dysfunctional uterine bleeding, which is not really how one thinks of lung cancer presenting. So we did chemotherapy and radiation as one of the more aggressive ways to treat this. I think they threw everything at me but the kitchen sink. The first day, Gail walked in, they were doing a tour and said, this is your going to get your chemo, and she walked in and screamed, I'm here. She has been a ball of energy, and it honestly lights up her day when she comes in. Give me my love. She is young. She is healthy. We wanted to give her her best chance at a long response. And she had an excellent response. She got all of her treatments, and she had no evidence of disease. And it stayed that way for a couple of years. You know, you start back to living again, and you start back to doing stuff that you were doing before. And then... She called me and she said, your scans came back, something's growing. So, here we are. And so at this point I have a stage four cancer that had come back despite our initial treatments. And I wanted to find a way of treating her that offered her her best chance, but also a good quality of life. And this is where immunotherapy really shines. In patients for whom this works, they can have these long, durable responses with minimal side effects. I'm not as tired. I can still move. I can still get up. I can go and do all the things that I want to do. I live a pretty full life. Gail abdicated for herself. She went and sought medical attention when she had a problem. There are other patients, because of their mistrust in the medical community, that Either when they have a bad side effect or maybe even from the beginning, they do not necessarily seek medical care. My union provides for my job health care, so they have a clinic and everything within the union building. Some people don't have that. You have to have somebody that you can go to that sa and say, I have a symptom, I have a problem, can you help me? And have faith that that person will hear you, respect you, and find an answer for you. It is well recognized that African Americans suffer a disproportionate uh, share of cancer mortality. One of the greatest um, contributing factors to disparities is the lack of um, black doctors in communities. We also have the fact that there was redlining in communities. And what that means is uh, blacks were offered loans to cover housing only in certain areas of cities. That led to food deserts, healthcare institution deserts. One of the big challenges for folks is just getting here. A lot of people don't have a car. We don't necessarily want them taking public transportation um, because there's lots of people on public transportation and you can get exposed to a lot of things. Paratransit services are available for some insurances, um, but that system is extremely overtaxed. So a treatment that for one person who's able to drive up park and valet parking, come in and out, might take two hours. For someone relying on paratransit, it's a six hour day. Not everybody has access to a job that will give them time off. Do you take a day off from work and lose that financial resource, the money for a day? Or do you go for health care? My cousin has lupus. She has to stay employed in order to stay insured. No matter how sick you are, you still have to go to work in order to get insurance, in order to get healthy. But when she gets sick she and she can't work for a month or two months, that job has moved on, so the insurance is gone too. 
there are many, many barriers to patients to try to get care. But some are really basic, like access, right? So we know that access to health insurance is, since insurance is the way that most people get care in the United States, that if people have either limited insurance or no health insurance, that that's a real barrier to care. And then you end up with delayed diagnoses, you end up with more advanced disease, you end up with illness that should not have happened. And even people with the very best insurance face financial challenges. People who are getting cancer treatment have increased out-of-pocket expenses. So you have less money coming in and more money coming out, and the math just doesn't work out. It all kind of started accidentally. I had a doctor that I was going for something else, and then they found the cancer. Well, my world just crushed. I was upset. You know, everybody is, I think, when they first hear that. They think the worst, and uh, he just held me in his, in, in his arms, and I just cried my heart out. It was so far gone that they were saying, okay, we need to take the lung out, or two-thirds of the lung. I mean, I went through chemo twice, I had radiation, I lost my hair twice, I had all kind of uh, bronchostomies, I had three of those. I mean, you do what you have to do to stay alive, so you make things work. And I did that for a good couple of years. We would come out of those sessions and it was like she could just about get to the car. I was just so deathly ill. And my oncologist, he said, all right, Roseanne, we're going to try something else. He said, there's a new drug out. I'm going to give it to you with the chemo, and we're going to see what happens. After I had, I think it was three treatments, we realized that that was going to keep me alive. She was prescribed an IV immunotherapy. She had a 20% out of pocket that she had to pay. We have um, Medicare Advantage insurance. We don't have a secondary insurance because we really couldn't afford it, to be honest with you. So we were unaware at the time that I was receiving this medication that it was not covered by the insurance, okay? So when we received these bills, we didn't know what to do. There were thousands of dollars. Usually with a lot of um, these expensive drugs, the manufacturer offers a copay card to assist with the copay, but none of these copay cards and government funding can actually work just because she's Medicare. I started to say, what else can we do? So I had accumulated two and a half pages of names of either companies, foundations, uh, uh, benefit programs, et cetera. I can't begin to tell you how many never call back. Then out of the blue, it dawned on me. Let me find out who makes this drug. They have a program. Since it's not an off-label use, she told me you can fill out the form, get the patient's information and income, and we'll take it from there. She would send it, and they would call back. We don't have it. We don't have it. I'm getting fax number after fax number after fax number. <laughs> Let's okay, it. that was the frustration part. Well, that's all frustration that stops people from moving forward. When she got approved, she was beyond excited about it because obviously the alternative was she wasn't gonna continue on this medication. There's always a way, you know, whether it's through copay card, whether it's funding, and that's part of the goal is to search and find the right thing that fits this patient's and their, co their insurance. So every year we have to fill out all the paperwork and then they decide if I'm eligible or not. And we keep our fingers crossed. And he calls them constantly. Did it go through? Did she get it? Is, you know, and that's what you have to do. Sometimes these patients are not capable of doing that. A lot of our patients that need assistance are those that can't speak English and can't fill those forms. So I feel like our role is to guide them and help them to Take away that stress. All they need to worry about is their cancer and their disease and how they're gonna deal with that. That's a lot for them to handle. The person that's going through it shouldn't have to deal with it because that frustration alone is a nightmare. They have to concern themselves with dealing with taking the medication, all the side effects that goes along with it because there were times where she'd take a treatment on a Thursday and Sunday she still couldn't get out of bed. My side effect is I, I'm very tired. 
and it's not very tired. It's my whole body is tired. It like it aches. And that lasts for about three or four days. Every three weeks, I go every three weeks. And you do get to see the same people that are there with you at the same time. You know, you just wonder, you know, like, um, it, are they really okay? I mean, I do. I sit there and, you know, and I look at everybody and that's where I am. And I think to myself, are they okay? Or are they really, are they, do they have anybody? You see someone who you could tell that it was so difficult for them to even get there, to get to the treatment. And I'm lucky because, thank God, I'm able to, to get around on my own, but I always have him. I'm never alone. I always have him, and he takes very good care of me. A lot of times people will come to us and Cancer isn't their biggest issue that's going on in their life. It's not uncommon for us to meet a patient who is the primary caregiver for a spouse. People are caring for elders, they're caring for children. People's lives are complex. It's critical to not assume that we understand what someone's situation is like at home. We might not know the financial challenges that they're facing unless we ask. We might not know that they don't have food in the refrigerator or aren't feeling well enough to prepare it if we don't ask. You know, so much of it is really listening. You know, where's the patient at that point? And from that awareness, what is it that I can bring to the conversation? And, and also that there be, to be aware when it's just clearly too much and to be able to say, you know, we're gonna pause and we'll talk again. I wouldn't expect somebody to tell me everything about them the first time they're meeting me. I wouldn't share everything about myself the first time I'm meeting someone or feel comfortable being vulnerable with someone. So I try to approach it with humility, you know, with kind of this almost awe or respect that, that a patient is willing to allow me into their life at a time that is their most difficult. We had to get out of the house and we really didn't have any place else to go. So we've been at the hotel for a year now. When we first got here, it was nice, quiet. I mean, it, it's a different way of living. The water's paid, the electric's paid, you know. That was a concern of us being homeless, not being able to have my oxygen machine. So it's, you know, kind of comforting knowing, you know, that we don't have to worry about the electric being turned off. We sleep in the bed from the hotel, and my daughter and the grandkids sleep on air mattresses. Right. You know, and the dog's allowed, and he's, he's our life, you know. We've learned to do different things with just having a two burner stove. I mean, I can make a meatloaf on top of the stove. <laughs> He's good. So we're, we're getting by. We do save a little bit of money on food by going to the food cupboards. When the, I was diagnosed with the melanoma, it was a, it was a complete shock. I was sitting at home one night, started having really bad pains in my belly. It just kept getting worse and worse. Ended up coming to the ER, and uh, they did all kinds of x-rays and scans and blood work, and found tumors on my liver, my kidneys, and that's when Dr. Morganston got involved. When you were admitted to the hospital, the way you presented, we thought you had pancreatic cancer, and actually it turns out you had melanoma. Um, so we've been treating you with immunotherapy all this time, yep. you know? When I was diagnosed, based on it being at stage four already, they told me I had three years. Now, I mean, it, it scared the hell out of me, I have to be honest. You know, if I had met you back in, you know, during my fellowship, uh, which was uh, 2004, um, 2007, we didn't have immunotherapy like we have today. Right. We had uh, chemotherapy, and people didn't do as well as they do now with immunotherapy. So right. I think 
we're all very grateful we have these medications. I'm kind of, I guess, pretty lucky. I tolerated it pretty well, considering I remember you had told me since it wasn't chemo or radiation that I wouldn't lose my hair. <laughs> Two years into the treatments, yeah. just out of nowhere, it just started to, I would, it just started to fall out. Yeah, that's right. You've got a beautiful skull, man. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, my, my grandson, one day he came up and he started like rubbing my head. He said, Pop Pop, I like your head. <laughs> and he just just rubs it and he just, he's a character. I'm pleased with how well he's done. And it's not just the disease. He's a full person and he's got family and living situation and all that. And it's a lot for one family to, to endure. When I finally did turn 62 at the end of December last year, since I was on disability at the point, they made me go to retirement. It put a little bit of a hurting on us because Medicare doesn't cover as much as the Medicaid did. If it came down to having to pay out of pocket for it, I would, I would, I would probably end up having to stop treatments. And that would not be a good thing. I, I just feel sometimes overwhelmed with myself and with, with her health problems. I'm her caregiver. I have a lot of problems breathing. I have this giant hernia, which I need surgery again. You know, it's just, it's a lot. You know, mostly the breathing is the, the hardest thing. Just, I can't do much. If you can't breathe, you can't, you can't walk nowhere. You can't, you know. He, he takes care of mostly everything. I don't know how he does it, but he's just, he's amazing. It's been about five months since they told me I was in remission. It was a miracle. And he wouldn't tell me. He called me on the phone, told me he had good news, but he wouldn't tell me till he got home. And then he told me and I just lost it. When they told me, I mean, it just, it took me back, you know. I, I, I had to take a couple steps back because it was something that neither one of us would have ever expected to happen. We were all hugging and crying, and it was, it was a moment, boy. There's the patient in front of you, and you do your best to take care of that person. But that person lives as part of a family, however they define that. That family is part of a community. One of my areas of focus is in uh, cancer risk reduction. And in order to do that, you, you have to go to the community. For example, we have a bus that goes to the communities for screening for breast cancer, mammograms, screening for cervical cancer, screening for prostate cancer, and uh, information. And we're going to extend that to screening for lung cancer. The earlier you find the cancer, the greater the opportunities uh, for treatment that allows for better outcomes. Another area that we really need to focus on is uh, minority communities, including Blacks, participating in clinical trials. Disparities in terms of clinical trial participation I think has been a challenge for cancer centers for years. You can't have trials that aren't representative of the population that you're treating. Immunotherapy is relatively new. We're still trying to figure out all the ways in which we can use it. The way we make progress is through clinical trials. The people that have access, they'll have access. They'll get care. But the people that don't have access, that's where you can make a difference.